Uh, as you all know, in fact, Harvard's program on negotiation, our instruction in terms of negotiation, which uh, began now, uh, I guess, some 35 years ago, uh, it has served in many ways as a model for law schools all over the country. And indeed, we've prided ourselves at viewing as part of our task uh, to teach young lawyers uh, how to be problem solvers and uh, how to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, I've found since I've been here, it's been a very exciting opportunity to be blessed with our extraordinary students and to uh, teach with a remarkable group of colleagues, uh, a couple of whom, in fact, are on our panel today. Now, I'm not going to spend any time introducing the panelists, but I want to just describe our process. Uh, each of the five of us is going to talk for no more than 10 minutes. It's going to be a short talk, and it's going to be personal, and it's going to be about a remarkable range of ways that we have individually and collectively participated in negotiation and dispute resolution. Uh, after each presentation, we're going to have time for a couple questions focused on that presentation. But we, we're only going to have five minutes. So my job is going to be to make sure that we don't get statements, but we get things with a question mark at the end, and that they're reasonably brief. After the five of us have done that, and we've had these five little mini sessions, we should have some time at the end for a more open conversation where we could have cross-cutting uh, topics. Well, without more to do, I'd like to introduce first uh, <coughs> my colleague, uh, Jennifer Reynolds. Jennifer is a professor at the University of Oregon who's a visiting professor this year here at, Law, here at Harvard Law School. She was an active participant in the program on negotiation and the negotiation uh, training we did here. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. Um, well, thank you guys so much for being here. As Bob just said, um, today you're going to hear a lot of different stories having to do with negotiation and dispute resolution. Some of these stories involve powerful players, or high stakes deal making, um, profound struggles, and entrenched conflicts. Um, Okay, maybe I could put this up. Is this better? All right, so there's gonna be some stories of big conflicts coming today, um, but not my story. What I wanna talk about is small disputes, the dust up, the minor argument, the complaint that's not recognized by the legal system, the low dollar disagreement. Small disputes don't always get a lot of attention from the law or in the academy because they don't seem very important. But small disputes matter. They matter in two ways that are often related. First, small disputes matter to the people who are involved in them. Maybe this is obvious. And second, small disputes matter because of what they can tell us in the aggregate. Today I want to reflect on these two aspects of small disputes by telling you about an experience I had last year, something that really made me think about small disputes in a different way. As Bob said, I'm a tenured law professor at the University of Oregon. Two years ago, when I was getting ready to take my sabbatical, the ombudsperson at our university suddenly left. Uh, the university wanted to do a national search to replace him, but they needed someone in the short term to take over the office. I delayed my sabbatical for a year so that I could serve as the interim ombudsperson. It sounded very exciting to me. Uh, rather than spend time in the library thinking abstract thoughts and writing articles no one would read, I'd be going into the trenches of workplace conflict. I'd never been an ombuds before, but I knew the basic deal. An organizational ombuds is someone who helps individuals and groups manage conflict in the workplace. Uh, people who come to the office are called visitors, and when they speak with the ombuds, that conversation is confidential. The ombuds is impartial as to the rightness or wrongness of the visitor's issue and works independently of management and formal processes and basically just helps the visitor think through options. The ombuds has a stewardship function too, University ombuds provide feedback on trends and on potential problem areas uh, to the university leadership. And this feedback is usually presented in the form of anonymous aggregate data. 
I ended up serving as the interim ombuds for about eight months. Over that period, I worked on more than 100 cases, some involving just one person, others involving two or more, from, with, working with people from all over the university, students, faculty, staff, even the occasional parent. Uh, I learned many things about universities and organizations from this work. For example, I learned that bosses who are consistently mean are actually less stress producing than bosses who shift between being nice and being mean. Um, I learned how, just how divisive university politics can be. I learned that most people don't know how to give feedback or receive feedback, even if the feedback is good. I learned that discrimination is pervasive but not always easy to see or even describe, and certainly not easy to figure out how to handle. I learned that many problems that look like interpersonal problems are actually just structural problems when you dig into them, and they relate to things like poorly written position descriptions or unclear chains of command. But the most important thing I learned from my time as an ombuds is that small disputes matter. Let me give you an example. One of my first visitors was an administrative assistant who was afraid to ask her supervisor off, uh, afraid to ask her supervisor for a day off to attend a wedding. Let's call her Jane. Jane was a longtime employee of the university. Uh, her supervisor was a relatively recent hire. In the few months they'd been working together, they had not hit it off. The relationship felt very stiff and awkward. Um, and in fact, the supervisor had recently harshly criticized Jane about some, some way that Jane handled an assignment. Jane wanted to go to this wedding, uh, but she was worried about asking because she thought, one, her supervisor would say no, and two, the, ask, the act of asking itself would worsen the relationship. So just pause for a moment. We're sitting in my office. Jane has told me this story and is now dabbing at her eyes with a tissue. I feel some compassion for her because she's upset, but I'm also thinking, you know, seriously, this is the trenches of workplace conflict just ask your supervisor for the day off. Schedule a meeting, explain the situation, problem solve around work-related issues that the day off might create, and then just go from there. It looked like such an easy case, I thought. You know, what's, is this really such a big deal? And then it came to me. Yes, it actually was a big deal. It was a big deal to Jane. It didn't matter that I would find it easy. It wouldn't have mattered if every single person in the world other than Jane would have found it easy. It wasn't how the situation struck me, it was how it struck her. And in this case, under these circumstances, Jane simply could not imagine how to ask for what she wanted. So I decided that if she felt that she had a problem, then we were gonna give it the same attention we would give any more important sounding negotiation. We started with the interests and alternatives at stake, hers and her supervisors. For those of you who took negotiation here, we did the seven elements analysis, um, we thought through how intention and impact might be a helpful framework for understanding some of the relational dynamics at play, and how shifting from blame to contribution might be a more productive approach when reflecting on the failed assignment. Many thanks, of course, to Sheila and Doug Stone for, um, for providing us with these helpful approaches. Uh, we did role play. We did reverse role play, all about asking for a day off. We tried out different opening lines. We practiced various responses based on what the supervisor might say or how the supervisor might react. Um, we thought about what attitude Jane wanted to bring to the meeting and how she would keep that attitude throughout. This was a Thursday. Jane had a standing meeting with her supervisor on Friday mornings. Before she left my office that day, I told her that if she decided to make the request that next morning, to remember that she could always circle back with me and we could debrief what happened. You know, regardless of what happened, we could always debrief it. Jane called me the next afternoon, very happy. The meeting had gone well. The supervisor was much nicer than she had expected and she did get the day off. She also said she felt like her relationship just felt better and more professional with her boss. Now, I don't know if Jane's boss was really as bad as Jane thought. Maybe the supervisor was nice all along. Maybe she would have said yes to this day off even without an hour-long preparation uh, before the meeting. Again, this was objectively small potatoes in the big scheme of things in the workplace. But for Jane, figuring out how to bridge the gap between where she was and where she wanted to go was really tough. She needed some support to find out how to get from point A to point B. And without that support, it's easy to imagine how being unhappy, saying nothing, feeling stressed, saying nothing, 
wanting something but being afraid to ask for it and so saying nothing, how all of this could build into significantly uh, potentially costly drains on workplace productivity, team morale, professional development, not to mention personal health and happiness. Over my term as the ombuds, I had many cases just like this, just like Jane's, small disputes over relatively insignificant matters. Uh, often these small disputes just required attention, some analysis, some coaching, something to reorient the person or people involved to a more constructive approach. Uh, these small disputes mattered in that first way I described. They were important to the people involved. And then, after a few months, I started to see more of the second way that small disputes matter as symptoms of bigger problems. When you've seen enough visitors as the ombuds, you begin to detect certain patterns in some of these visits that provide insight into how the university is working. For example, based on the kinds of small disputes I was seeing, I began to identify possible areas of improvement around supervisor and staff training. In addition, I began to see fluctuations in disputes that appeared to correspond with certain events on the university calendar. Um, occasionally, some small disputes would even suggest potential issues related to certain individuals or certain departments around what appeared to be maybe persistent problems, often, as I said before, structural problems. These insights let me give feedback to the organization. For example, I proposed possible new trainings to address common deficiencies. I developed new materials to support people in high conflict times. Um, and when the data suggested potential issues related to specific individuals or departments, I sometimes spoke with university leadership about these possible trends. Uh, on this last matter, speaking with university leaders about possible warning signs or trends can be very tricky. You don't want to bring trivial matters to the attention of high-level administrators, but you also don't want them to be blindsided if something's brewing. And it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between trivial matters on the one hand and something brewing on the other. In other words, when do small disputes map to a big problem? At what point are they evidence of a real trend? The Jane situation was not, at least as far as I could tell, a small dispute that was part of a larger trend, other than just sort of a general trend around people being afraid to ask for things. Uh, but some visitors with Jane-like problems, that is, people having small disputes with coworkers, did seem to be part of a larger problem. For example, in one case, I had heard from six employees, all from the same department, all complaining about the same supervisor. I ended up contacting that supervisor's boss, let's call him Tom, and I let him know what I was hearing. I would only make these kinds of calls, by the way, if I could preserve my visitor's confidentiality, and I would be very careful never to vouch for the accuracy of their stories or advocate for them in any way. In this case, Tom asked to meet with the people who talked to me, so I checked back with them, and they were eager for this conversation. So as it turned out, they really liked Tom, but they hadn't thought that they could directly contact him with their concerns. So they all met at my office. It was a very good, candid conversation. Tom told me afterward he really valued their input because uh, in his position, he was so busy and overextended, it was really impossible for him to keep his ear to the ground and know what was going on on the front lines. Um, he and I ended up having several follow-up conversations at his um, initiation as he worked through the next steps in his department. So that is my story. I went into the ombuds office with grand ambitions, thinking I was going to be working on university conflicts and controversies. And I was right about that, but it was not what I expected. It was often about small disputes and not big ones. Realizing that small disputes matter, that they're genuinely important, has been really good for my research and my teaching. Dispute resolution scholars often wonder, for example, how we can preserve the benefits of private dispute resolution without losing the ability to identify and work on larger problems. We want people to solve their own issues as locally as possible, but not if that means letting serial wrongdoers or system-wide dysfunctions go unchecked. Perhaps we could call this the Harvey Weinstein challenge. My experience has shown me that one answer to this question, at least for organizations, is to create an ombuds function that is sufficiently empowered to help individuals, but also has the ear of management. Um, these offices are not a cure-all, but they can be useful for an organization seeking to manage conflict, which includes preventing preventable disputes. So I'll just, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, do I think, it, okay. Absolutely. We have a few minutes for questions.
those of us uh, in Washington, D.C., who've been condemned to attend too many cocktail parties and uh, too many political speeches have observed how much easier it is for uh, people to lie when they're standing. Uh, <laughs> No reflection on my colleagues, of course. Uh, it's a Monday afternoon in Washington about three years ago. Two o'clock sharp, House of Representatives, chairman of the House Committee is gaveling the hearing to order. Apparent purpose of the hearing in the glare of C-SPAN's TV cameras is for the majority of the committee to attack and uh, ridicule the Affordable Care Act, uh, which they called Obamacare, uh, and anyone who implements or supports that act. Uh, they have a single Obamacare witness from the Obama administration, and their hope is that over the next few hours, uh, that individual can be tricked, bullied, harassed, worn out, uh, or otherwise goaded by the 16 members of the majority to make some admission, concession, indiscretion that might be taken out of context and usefully incorporated in a political ad or uh, TV news. Uh, I was that hapless administration witness. When uh, congressional committees uh, scheduled hearings to attack the Affordable Care Act, uh, and its implementation. Uh, if it was implementation I was involved in, I uh, from time to time was selected uh, for, my, for my sins, which evidently were quite considerable to be the witness representing the administration uh, in this relevant piece of political theater. Uh, so on this occasion, I'm in the waiting room 10 minutes before two uh, at the committee. Somewhat to my surprise, the chairman stops in uh, and uh, personally thanks me for taking the time to come. We didn't know each other before that. And to testify, I know how busy you are, really appreciate it. And by the way, I hope you won't take it personally uh, if some of our guys come across today uh, a little bit feisty. Um, y y between you and me, you know how they can get when it comes to Obamacare. Uh, but we'll, we'll see if we can rein them in. Uh, ten minutes later, we're at the hearing, I'm at the witness table, not unlike this, actually, uh, and the chairman gavels the hearing to order, uh, the TV cameras start to roll, and suddenly that, that chummy vibe is history. Uh, he's got his game face on, uh, and he's staring at me as if he's never seen me before. Uh, and in tones in a loud voice, the witness will stand, raise his right hand, and repeat after me, I state your name, do solemnly swear, tell the truth, hold truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Really? Uh, I testified before House and Senate committees a couple dozen times, and I couldn't recall ever having been made to, to swear in, uh, but, but here we were. It promised to be a long afternoon, and it was. Uh, although we ultimately escaped uh, unscathed to, uh, to tell the story. How did I get there? What does it have to do with negotiation? The answer relates to the most peculiar negotiation experience I've had in government, uh, which illustrates not only the importance but the pervasiveness of negotiation and dispute resolution. When I was here as a student, I wanted to contribute to public policy, uh, started out in law practice, was a partner at Covington and Burling, invited to join the government, and when I first did, we were on the cusp of the biggest domestic initiative of our generation, health care reform. I uh, uh, was privileged to be a member of the ultimately ill-fated Hillary Clinton Health Care Reform Task Force of 1993, uh, which was a great effort, but uh, did not uh, produce uh, a law, as you know. And uh, I later was uh, out of government policy advisor to the Obama and, and Hillary Clinton presidential campaigns, and then joined the Obama administration as senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury for Health 
policy and retirement policy. That meant I was on the team that oversaw implementation of the Affordable Care Act, the development and implementation, rulemaking, et cetera. And this involved a lead role in my case for the portion of the effort dealing with employer-sponsored health plans, especially the famous employer mandate. So recognizing that the vast majority of workers get their coverage from employers, uh, and then employers pay most of the cost, typically the mandate as most of you know, was designed to expand coverage and prevent employers from taking advantage of these new subsidies in the exchanges, which have been in the news the last few weeks, uh, to drop their health plans and shift their employees over to the exchanges. The private sector, Congress, and the press were all nervously watching how this mandate would be interpreted. So was the administration. Uh, would it all play out badly and jeopardize the whole act? Uh, would the rules be too complex that we would develop around the mandate? Would they disrupt coverage? Would employers drop their plans, uh, et cetera? There were predictions of job loss, of people being shifted from full-time to part-time, a firestorm of criticism from corporate America, big business, small business alike, for interfering needlessly with the healthcare system. Was, um, uh, was poised to occur uh, at the first misstep. Especially franchises, fast food, restaurants, retail, hospitality, hotels, you know, the places where there are a lot of part-timers, seasonal, shift workers, and so on, uh, whose hours are hard to track. The law had a 30-hour-a-week cutoff, a definition of full-time employee that was a little counterintuitive, not 40 or 35, but 30 hours. Uh, and you had to cover, if you're an employer above 50 employees, all those people, or else it was a pay or play, pay a, a penalty. We went to the employers at the beginning of this rulemaking and asked them, how do you uh, view the priorities here? What's the most important set of issue that we should, issues uh, that we should tackle first? And they came back with the 30 hour a week requirement. It came under fire immediately from the business community, hard to monitor, uh, not uh, standard. Uh, and so uh, we decided that we would not do a negotiated rulemaking, but do a rulemaking that would be a quasi-negotiation, that the stakes were so high, uh, the, the situation was so fraught, and frankly, Congress was watching over our shoulder with the potential to maybe intervene in whatever we did or override what we did. So we had a kind of uh, un an unusual degree, I'd say, of consultation with the regulated communities, with the stakeholders, a kind of quasi-negotiation. Uh, and my, my approach benefited a great deal from my uh, having taken administrative law here with Steve Breyer. Uh, who was terrific, and also having been privileged to have uh, Professor Richard Neustadt as my mentor in the public policy program, who emphasized in his classic work, Presidential Power, which was a kind of Bible for JFK, that the president uh, needs to function not only as a commander, but very much as a persuader and negotiator uh, in order to, to really wield power effectively. So we began by announcing we wanted priorities from the stakeholders. We got them. Uh, this 30-hour issue, uh, top of, uh, of mind for them. Uh, and we started to discuss with them how did they administer their plans to screen out part-time people and cover full-time people, which is typical corporate practice, as many of us know. Turned out that that was a, uh, a happy beginning they were delighted to explain to us exactly how they did it, and they learned, and we learned that every company did it a little bit differently, and that the complexity that the corporate community typically accuses the government of unnecessarily fomenting was present, not unnecessarily, generally uh, appropriately, uh, unavoidably, in each of their programs. It was just complexity that they'd grown accustomed to because they'd created it uh, for, for good reasons. After dozens of meetings and conference calls, we created a regulatory construct that permitted employers 
to use a rough amalgam of what all these different companies were doing, kind of put an umbrella over it, and said, you can do something like this. Uh, and instead of putting it out in the traditional way, a proposed regulation, get comments, final regulation, we floated the idea in a notice, invited feedback, uh, just a possible approach, uh, and we got another several dozen meetings with corporate America, uh, tons of written comments, uh, issued a new notice inviting comment on an improved version of these concepts, floating possible approaches on other key issues, and all told we did this six times. There's six rounds, instead of just a proposed reg and a final reg, four successive notices, each one trying to improve on the previous one, each one uh, with oral comments and, and dozens of meetings and scores of written comments, uh, so that by the time we were done, we departed radically from the classic two-step rulemaking model uh, and instead had a multiple round rulemaking process to maximize dialogue. It helped demonstrate we were open to being educated uh, and the uh, shareholders, I think, felt it gave, the, the stakeholders felt it gave proof of our uh, sincerity that we weren't indifferent to their concerns. We were really listening, which is something that Bob's books emphasize uh, very appropriately. Uh, and uh, we fostered a bit of a we're all in this together spirit. Uh, in fact, we took it to the point where uh, uh, when we came into a meeting, I would insist that my staff intersperse and uh, not sit on one side of the table opposite the other side, but to get rid of that kind of symbolism and instead we're all kind of on the same team, more or less, within, within reality. Uh, other things that worked were that we tried to be consistent and tried to focus, and this is another Bob Manukin piece of advice that, uh, that I found extremely valuable. We tried to focus on the difference between the agent's values and the principal's values. That is, when someone's representing an organization, whether they're the head of it or there's some officer or their counsel or what have you, where's the daylight between, if you're trying to understand the other person's objectives and concerns, what's the difference there? So we helped the heads of hostile trade associations that were lobbying to repeal our Affordable Care Act every day on Capitol Hill. We met with them about the regs and we tried to help them uh, achieve their personal objectives better, made ourselves accessible, gave their members the opportunity to talk directly to the regulators, gave them quick responses to technical questions, uh, put people uh, on notice. As soon as we issued something, one of these six issuances, we would brief uh, the whole community, 30, 40 telephone conference calls within a day including weekend and, and night access. And so we ended up uh, really uh, surprisingly developing a certain trust uh, and consistency of expectations that we were able to uh, fulfill. Uh, in the end, uh, they really appreciated those little things like being willing to speak at their conferences, even when it was a hostile audience of 2,000 people in a hotel ballroom, or to talk on the phone with one corporate uh, person who had a real uh, problem. We didn't get lo job losses. We didn't get shifts to part-time in any material way. We didn't get the kinds of nightmare scenarios, dropping of employer plans that so many people had predicted. Uh, it seemed to work. And the uh, lessons uh, that I draw are now basically this: what Bob has in his Negotiating with the, with the Devil uh, book uh, and in his other writings, uh, including Finding the Common Ground, Trying to Add Value for Everyone, which I think we were able to do, and uh, uh, really thinking hard and listening hard to figure out other people's goals and your own goals. A little coda here. A couple years later, they, held, they called another hearing, uh, a, a series of them, uh, to talk about the job-killing regulations that we were issuing on the employer mandate, et cetera. I was the witness scheduled to 
to appear. We started preparing testimony. And the day the private sector witnesses were about to be announced, uh, those whose role would be to blame the government for its excesses, the hearing was surprisingly canceled. The committee could not find private sector witnesses, even rounding up their usual suspects, who are willing to blame the government or complain about our process or even about our substantive outcome. It seemed like a successful exercise in dispute resolution at the time. Unfortunately, the Affordable Care Act uh, continues to generate dispute and, and sadly, still no uh, definitive resolution. So I'm going to talk about a medium-sized conflict. And I stand because I'm vertically challenged, not because I'm dishonest. Um, I, uh, we have a problem in our field of negotiation. Uh, and I uh, hope in the 10 minutes uh, allotted uh, for this uh, discussion, and there'll be a little more for questions, to identify the problem and offer you a tool for managing the problem. And the problem is the one that's up on the screen. We've all read getting to yes, and we've operated on the assumption that people will negotiate in their rational self-interest. And if we can help them identify those interests, uh, identify options to serve those interests, why we can come with, up with a Pareto optimal solution and we're all set. Um, I have yet to encounter a negotiation in which people behaved in precisely that way. And indeed, when I ask negotiators and mediators around the country and other countries, uh, what has been your experience? The universal experience is that getting the steam out of the kettle, so to speak, allowing people to vent their emotion, is actually not enough because emotion still drives their decision making. And so the question is, how do we best understand not only their emotions, but our own? Because we are uh, uh, people as well, and we have, thank you, and we have our own uh, uh, feelings about what's going on in the room. One of my feelings uh, that I'm not proud of is that when people give, uh, make an unproductive comment in a mediation, I'm serving as the mediator, there's a part, an angry part of me that rises up. And it's, I call it my dumb part because it stands for don't mess up my mediation. And I have to remember it's not my mediation, right? It's their mediation. It's our mediation. So the way I got a better handle on this problem of the role of emotion in negotiation mediation was from one of my uh, best teachers, uh, my late wife, Beth Andrews. Uh, she and I were married 34 years. She died three years ago. A number of people in this room met Beth, knew her. Bob was at her memorial service. And uh, I met her when she was a potter, which is why I show you this picture. At the time, I was a woodworker. We met at a craft fair. How 60s is that? I mean, really. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I was wearing bib jeans and flannel shirts back then also. Um, and uh, she went on, uh, as I went on from being a woodworker to being a lawyer and now mediator, she went on from being a potter to being a psychotherapist and also an excellent photographer. And uh, she introduced me to a model that she had learned as a psychotherapist, which I find extremely useful for lawyers and mediators. Uh, Beth introduced me to this guy, Dick Schwartz, who is the guy who came up with the internal family systems model. And family systems, is, it's a deceptive uh, name. Even Dick regrets it because it's not about families. It's about people. It's about individuals. It's about what goes on in our heads, the many parts and subpersonalities that populate our minds. And uh, so I went on to write an article to show what I hope is a useful application of this model to managing the negotiation within, because we have to do that not only for ourselves, but help people manage their own negotiation. I'll illustrate that with a story in a moment. Uh, but first of all, actually, let me uh, ask a question before I get into the New Yorker cartoons. Um, has anyone here in this room participated in a negotiation today and if so, what was your very first, your earliest negotiation? Anybody? Yes. Th today. This morning. Anybody participate in one this morning? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> Negotiated with herself. And who won that negotiation? The part that wanted to get up and come to this workshop, right? right? Yes. And there was a part of you that thought I could use a little more sleep. I had that same negotiation when my alarm went off and I had to decide whether to hit the snooze button. And this is, in fact, a common understanding for all of us about what goes on inside, as illustrated in The New Yorker, which is the source of all wisdom, I think, in the cartoons. Part of me wants to help you with your crisis, Hargraves, but part of me wants to go to lunch. Um, or this fellow in a bar. Part of me says, I need to stop drinking like this. Then I think, don't listen to him, he's drunk. Um, so we all have this experience of complexity. And uh, in fact, our internal operating systems are described in recent books by Bill Urey, uh, Erica Fox, Gary Friedman has written a book uh, recently that helps us understand the negotiation uh, within. We even have an Academy Award-winning movie that illustrates the different parts inside us. And if you have not seen this movie, I highly recommend it. Um, I think of my internal operating system as like my phone. I have all these different apps. Some of them pop up without my asking them to, like my angry parts. Um, there's there's a, an angry part uh, right there. Um, I have uh, a Jewish part. I have a fun-loving part and uh, other parts, as you can see. Um, uh, this metaphor, by the way, comes from a psychiatrist here in Boston named Percy Ballard. Uh, we also have as one of our apps what we call self-energy, spirit, soul. In the wisdom traditions, people think of this as uh, our calm, compassionate, curious, centered part. And another metaphor, if you don't like the, uh, uh, the metaphor of the phone and the apps, is the conductor and the orchestra. There are no bad instruments. But if one uh, is playing uh, disharmoniously or too loud or too soft, the conductor, our self-energy, needs to coordinate those parts. And finally, I offer you this metaphor of self-energy as the mediator within. So uh, two problems that I have experienced as a negotiator and as a mediator. One of them is my clients are often ambivalent. One day they say we should stick to our guns, and the same client on the next day says we should settle and goes back and forth. And the internal uh, family systems model helps me understand that ambivalence is part of the normal, natural condition of people. We all have ambivalence. If we can access self-energy, we can help manage the tension between these different parts. And part of my job as a lawyer, because I also work as a collaborative law attorney, uh, is to help my clients manage th that ambivalence. As a mediator, I want to share with you a story involving a woman who was laid off. She was a high-level manager in a pharmaceutical company. And she was replaced by a man. And she filed a claim of sex discrimination. And represented by an excellent lawyer. And she came to my office with her lawyer. And the pharmaceutical company brought representatives and lawyers to mediate the conflict of how much she would be paid on account of her uh, claim. Now, as the primary earner in her family, and having been out of work for almost a year, there was a real problem, uh, because she was really under economic pressure to settle the case. And at a certain point, it became clear that the company was willing to pay $250,000 to settle the case. That was much less than her original demand. Uh, but this was really the end of the day, and the question was whether that would be good enough. I sat with her and her lawyer in a separate room, and I had the following conversation with her. It sounds like there's a part of you that wants to go the distance because it feels you were treated unfairly. This is an idealistic part of her that wanted justice, not just for her, but for other women. Absolutely, she said. And another part of you that's being very practical about the risks of going to trial it would have been another two years, maybe more with an appeal, not to mention the costs. And she said, yes, that too. Now, before I tell you the next part of the conversation, I want to share with you a detail about the mediation, which is that one of the drugs that she was responsible for in her company was one of the drugs. Sorry, that my, my wife used to take 
as part of her, her cancer treatment. And I discovered that early on in the mediation. We made a personal connection around that. I said, the drug that you were responsible for managing lengthened my wife's life by quite a bit. My wife struggled for four years with her cancer. She expressed her, her sorrow, her sympathy, and we kind of bonded around that fact. And I mention that fact because I think that relationship matters so much in negotiation. So getting into an up-close and personal connection with the people with whom we work can sometimes be helpful. And we also have to be mindful of boundaries because sometimes it's unhelpful. But as I sat across from her at the end of this day of mediation, I was about as far from her as I am from you. And I said, I think we all have a mediator inside us that helps us manage these different parts and helps us make wise decisions. Can you feel that mediator inside you? And I saw her get a little teary. So as you can see, it, the tears come easily <laughs> to me. I, it's one of, it's part of my operating system, what can I say? And she said, yes. She said, uh, I, I know that I need to settle this and move on. And it was a, uh, a very touching moment. And she stood up, and so I stood up. And she gave me a big hug, and then she gave her lawyer a big hug. We settled the case. But one of the lessons for me is not only about how we manage the negotiation within, but how we empower people to make their own choices. Before I understood about the internal family systems model and internal operating system, I thought my job in mediation was to be the advocate for settlement. And so as I would put out the reasons why settlement made sense, I would encounter, because the laws of physics tell us this, an equal and opposite force on the other side explained to me the reasons why settlement was not a good idea. And instead, now, I help people find the internal mediator that will help them make a wise decision. Uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, David, I'm particularly grateful to you, um, because it's been a really long time since I've been this nervous to get up and talk about something. Because what I decided I'm going to talk about today is something I've never talked about publicly before. Um, so, last January I was in Stockholm, and I was listening to this Finnish economist named Chell Nordstrom. By the way, as a kid growing up in Nebraska, that was not a sentence I thought I would ever say in my life, right? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he was talking about something about European nations. I actually don't even remember what it was. But he said in this offhand way, I mean, not America. America isn't a nation in the same way that European nations are nations. America's an idea. Huh. I've thought about that a lot this past year. I mean, he's right, right? America was founded on a set of ideas and principles that say who we are and how we relate to each other and to the government and how we're supposed to figure things out together. And that part, the democracy part, is really hard. It's a tall order that we have to actually talk to each other and figure out how to go forward to meet our challenges. Because everybody in this room has a real sense of how much easier it is for human beings to react to and escalate conflict than it is for us to engage it more productively, listen to and understand each other, and find solutions that we can agree on, at least agree on enough to try them out and then try to keep improving them. So, you know, how are we doing? on this little American idea experiment here in the 21st century. What do you think? There's been a lot of talk about how we all need to get out of our bubbles in this democracy. Um, and to be honest with you, frankly, I would like to actually be in a bubble a little bit more, because it's way more comfortable. Because actually, I married across the political divide. Yeah. For better or worse, richer or poorer, till death do us part. 
But I have to say that there was nothing in those vows 23 years ago about what to do if Trump were elected president. <laughs> so this little idea of America greets me every morning at the breakfast table. And we've got to figure out what to do about it. So in 2008, by the way, um, we had an Obama sign and a McCain sign in our yard. Um, we got so many questions about it in the small New England town just north of here where we live that we finally slapped a his and hers <laughs> onto them. Now in 2012, when you called up the campaign office to get your sign, they send you the whole party slate. So now I've got a dozen signs in my yard lined up along the road, cat calling my neighbors for their votes. <laughs> Over here. So we finally just planted a stake in the middle that said left and right to point to the appropriate signs. This, by the way, was the yard the morning after the election. Um, let's cut to 2016. No signs. If we had had signs, they would have said, not him and not her. By the way, did I mention that I met my husband here at Harvard Law School? <laughs> did I mention that we met because we were teaching assistants for the negotiation course with Roger Fisher? And yes, as a matter of fact, we both teach negotiation. These days, he's teaching down the street at that other school, MIT, at the Sloan School of Business. So here we are, my husband and me, supposedly among the more skilled at communication and difficult conversations and conflict resolution in our own little two-person microcosm of this American idea that we call diversity and democracy. And I have to tell you, it is not easy. As a matter of fact, here are a few actual quotes from a conversation that we had last week about the NFL anthem controversy. I can't believe you're on that side of this issue. You liberals, you hate America. Yeah, boo-hoo for your feelings. That was me, to him, by the way. <laughs> so, what are we supposed to do? Why is this so hard? And where am I going with this? I, you know, I know all of the good advice. I know that I'm supposed to move beyond arguing about why I'm right to why we see it so differently and to not attribute bad intentions to each other and to think about what we're each contributing to the problem and how our identities may be involved. I know that advice. I wrote that advice. It's great advice. It really is. And it's really hard to do. Maybe particularly right now. Maybe particularly when my internal voice is yelling, that is ridiculous. And how could you? How could we? So I've been thinking a lot about what feels harder now than it has for the last couple of decades. And a couple of things jump to mind. One is that we can't even agree on what it is if we're trying to understand why we see it differently. In any one issue, we have really different versions about what this is really about. Let's just take the NFL controversy, anthem set of issues. Turn to a person next to you. Pair up. I'm actually serious about this. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And with a partner in 30 seconds, come up with as many different things that different people on different sides of this set of issues would say this is actually about. OK? Well, what is it about? As many different ones as you can. Go. Okay, let me have your attention. Let's just do a quick, a quick list of as many as we can. What is this about? Who wants to start? What is free? It's about free speech. What's it about? 
police brutality and unequal treatment. Nice. What else? Discrimination. What else? Patriotism. Yeah. Millionaires. Yeah. Absolutely. Keep going. Bullying. Yep. Yep. Class struggle. Donald Trump. Politics. What else? Support for the military and sacrifice. Thank you. That one was really missing. It is what it's about. It is about that. So here's part of the problem, which is embedded in any one issue. There are at least a half dozen, in this case more than a dozen, different things that we think this is about. Plus, add to that, on any list of current issues we've got going right now, that list is like 100 issues long each one of which has at least half a dozen things embedded in it. So part of what I feel is hard right now is that it's hard to get traction actually talking about the same thing to get anywhere because, you know, I say A and you say B and then CNN and Fox and Twitter light up with issues 21, 22, and 23. And we're all shouting across each other and we're not talking about the same things. Now, by the way, the second thing is that at least with the NFL issues or the Anthem issues, um, we're actually watching the same broadcast, talking about the same behavior. So what we're debating about is what does it mean or what should or shouldn't people do. But these days, we're not watching the same things and we're not reading the same things, right? So the, our sources of news and information have become incredibly varied and with social media, less reliable. And so suddenly, the stories we're telling don't even have the same components. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the work that we were doing back in the 90s in Cyprus with Greek and Turkish Cypriots. They grew up being taught different histories, right? And so part of what was hard about understanding their conflict and moving forward is that they were telling such different stories. We used to do this exercise where we put a string down the middle of the room as a timeline. And we tell each side, go away and write down the key events that happen that tell the history of your conflict. And the Greek Cypriots would come back, and their timeline tended to start right around 1960, 1963. The Turkish Cypriots started in 1453. <laughs> and I feel like, at least in this country, the storylines and the stories we're telling across the country about our past and our present and certainly our future have become really different. And that's true not just about par across party lines, that's true across regions of the country. It's true across socioeconomic lines, across more educated and less educated, across racial lines, across native born and immigrant lines. And so we're not living in the same story these days. So what do we do? What would help? And I think that's what I've been wrestling with, which is do we as a field have something to offer? And to the extent that we do, is it enough? Is it making a big enough difference? The public dialogue, which is really monologues, yelling at each other, each feeling unheard, um, are, it feels to me like they're more and more, of course they're getting more and more vitriolic, but they're also starting to infect our private conversations and relationships with each other. And when we talk about the other, we make, characterize them with these extreme descriptions, right? So all Trump voters are racist and all Clinton voters don't care about corruption. It's very us, them. In fact, I was at the Walker Museum of Art last weekend in Minneapolis, and this captured some of it <laughs> for me, maybe me and my husband. But you know what? Any individual is not that one-dimensional. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people in this country with extreme views. Let's not pretend that they don't exist, but by and large, that is not the majority of people in this country. That is not who's sitting a across the table from me. It's not who lives across the street from me. It's not who lives across the country from me in my hometown in Nebraska where my parents and many of my childhood friends voted for Trump. So how do we see each other as 
more nuanced and complicated individuals and work to understand each other because the us-them rhetoric is not helping us see each other for who we actually are. It's instead having us see the other as extreme. I feel like the people in this room and on this campus maybe particularly have a responsibility to try to help and figure this out. I mean, whether you walked off this campus five years from now, or five years ago, um, or 40 years ago, or maybe you'll walk off at five hours from now, um, I think we carry a particular responsibility to try to help the world figure out how do we talk to each other across these differences in a more productive way so that we can try to find ways to engage more meaningfully with each other. And I don't have all the answers. We could talk all week about what that is, and maybe that's what we should be doing. I don't know. I don't know. America is an idea. The Massachusetts Bay Colony here was founded by immigrants. They were fleeing England and an authoritarian King Charles who had dissolved parliament several times over, by the way, and established personal rule, meaning he could do whatever the heck he wanted. So the Winthrop fleet left. And they arrived here in 1630 with 700 people on board those ships. One of them actually was Anthony Colby, who was the earliest in my family to arrive here. My eldest son's middle name is Colby. Also in that group, by the way, was Jehu Burr, and partly because of my middle son's high school history project a couple of weeks ago, I learned that my husband is descended from the Burrs. So it would take 360 years for us to bump into each other back here in Cambridge, but they came seeking the same, our ancestors came seeking the same ideas and ideals. And to me, the question is, how do we help keep our eye on that question? How do we engage more meaningfully? So here's my challenge to you. It's the 200th anniversary. Go out in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of months, find two people, find 20 people, find 200 people who see something differently than you do and see if you can understand why. See if you can get beyond whatever you assume is true about them to understand what is true and move from how could you to how could you. That's interesting. It's hard for me to imagine why. For me, the question is shifting from what can I do for my side to what can I do for our country. That's my charge to you. I do just want to add, it wasn't my family who shot Alexander Hamilton, okay? So I'm just, <laughs> just saying. I have the enviable task of describing to you an adventure I've had off and on during the last 12 or 13 years uh, working on what I think many consider among the most intractable conflicts in the world today. Do we have a flipper? Yes. Yeah. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In 2002, after the collapse in the year 2000 of the Oslo peace process, in the middle of what was called the Second Intifada, I was thinking hard about what I could do personally and what the program on negotiation might do to contribute towards this conflict. Although ambitious, I assure you, I had no illusions that somehow we were going to find an answer. But I hoped that by thinking hard about it, by bringing and applying some theory uh, in a small way, 
with colleagues here, uh, I might contribute to helping heal the world. There was something very paradoxical about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I've got to necessarily uh, discuss it in very abbreviated terms. The paradox is pretty well known. If there's going to be a deal in terms of a two-state resolution, and it's clear that a majority of both Israelis and Palestinians would like to make a deal, we all know what the parameters of that, we all know. Those who have studied it know the basic parameters of the deal. There are a lot of intractable conflicts where it's hard to imagine what, in fact, the deal might be. But if you put yourself in the shoes of a mediator here, that's not the problem. President Clinton outlined it during the Oslo process. Sophisticated Israelis and Palestinians, those who've been involved in the negotiations, they all know the basic parameters too. Basically, the land will be divided, starting with the 67 borders, there would be some land swaps so that a substantial proportion of the Jewish settlers in the West Bank would find themselves in Israel proper, and in exchange, the Palestinians would receive an equivalent amount of land. There would be security arrangements that would give Israel sufficient confidence that the new Palestinian state wouldn't be used as a basis for a continued uh, t terrorism. Jerusalem would be divided and the capital of both nations, where like a condominium, East Jerusalem would in fact be subject to the new Palestinian state. Much of the rest of Jerusalem would be subject to the Israel, be part of Israel. And the holy sites would be managed uh, sort of like a con, there are different ways of doing it, some of which would be akin to a condominium where the, the holy sites might be either under international jurisdiction uh, or under some kind of shared uh, cooperative uh, 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 jurisdiction. Uh, most of the other, not the most, the settlers, the Jewish settlers in the West Bank that weren't part of what would now be Israel would have to move back. And the Palestinians, their right of return would be the right to return to the new Palestinian state, not to Israel proper. Now I asked myself, and this was clear in the early 2000s, 15 years ago, what are the barriers? A question that as negotiation analysts, I've written a lot about. It's very helpful when there's a conflict that seems unresolved, to see if you can categorize what the ba ba barriers are. And the argument uh, and the conclusion I reached in terms of the barriers is that the primary barrier was not that the leaders who might be at the negotiation table didn't know what the deal would be, but that there were internal conflicts on each side that made it extraordinarily difficult to think about how the deal could be implemented and how as a leader you can in fact put together a winning coalition to implement the deal. Because there's spoilers on both sides. So I decided what would be interesting to sort of study is not details about the terms of the deal, but what might be done, if anything, to deal with the internal conflicts. Now, I have to confess, uh, as an assimilated Midwestern Jewish kid who uh, doesn't know Hebrew, I had no illusions that I was going to somehow uh, single-handedly be able to make peace among the Jews in Israel. Uh, because within Israel, let me assure you, the internal conflicts are very profound. But what uh, uh, I thought that the key internal conflicts were, of course, over the future of the settlements. And there are a lot of them. And that conflict is very profound because national religious settlers believe that 
settling all of Eretz Israel is a religious mandate. God intended Jews to have the West Bank. Biblical Palestine was not along the Mediterranean coast where Tel Aviv is. It was in the West Bank. And in fact, the national religious settlers who are combine uh, both uh, fervent nationalism and religious zeal, they're not the ultra-Orthodox, have in fact been driving the settlement movement. On the other hand, as all of you know, there are many, many other Israelis who feel that the settlements in the West Bank are a catastrophe. They rarely go to the West Bank. They feel that the state is subsidizing them hugely. And in terms of demonization, within the Israeli community, there's lots of demonization. Now, the same, of course, is true on the Palestinian side. The reason many Israelis are skeptical about the possibility of a negotiated re resolution with Abu Mazen, who, by the way, I think is not an entirely unreasonable guy, is because they say he has no control over Gaza. Is there going to be one Palestinian state or two Palestinian states? Is Fatah going to be in control or is it Hamas? They have different objectives. And the internal conflict among Palestinians, in fact, has at times led to a bloodshed. Well, let me briefly say, I'm not going to be able to go into any detail, is we, I've been involved in a couple different activities relating to this. One, which was one of the most fascinating things I've ever been involved in, was working on the issue of the internal conflict within Israel. And I did this primarily between 2002 and 2005. And uh, it turns out that, that the timing was fortuitous. I spent a year and a half going there and seeing if I could recruit a set of what turned out to be 11 Israelis representing an extraordinary range uh, of uh, views, uh, whether they'd be interested in talking to each other, believe it or not, about the West Bank, Gaza, and the future of the settlements. And uh, we met several times, and we had the good fortune that I began it before Prime Minister Sharon made his proposal for unilateral withdrawal from the West Bank. But this process continued during the time that was being implemented. Uh, uh, we had a number of we had five people who were hardcore settlers, uh, including uh, this man, Rabbi Avi Gezer, who became a, actually someone I uh, enjoyed a lot. Uh, Gezer uh, was eager to participate. He's the head rabbi of a settlement called Ofra, which is one of the key West. It, it's, it's where a lot of the leaders of the national religious movement are. And he was interested in mediation. And he knew some of my work. And he said, oh, Professor Manukin, this is a wonderful thing you're trying to do. This was in translation. He said, and I'd like to participate, but on one condition. I said, what's the condition? And he said, everyone who comes must accept as a ground rule, this is our land. <laughs> well, because another participant was going to be the founder of an organization called Peace Now, a third was going to be the chief Israeli negotiator uh, during the Oslo process. Uh, I thought, that's not too promising. But I had the wit. I internalized uh, something I've learned from Sheila Heen. And I said, uh, I can tell you feel very strongly about this. Uh, could you say more? And he said to me, Yes, if someone would acknowledge that this is our land, I'm prepared to talk about maybe this is not the time we should be occupying our land. So I suddenly had the sense, my god, this was a guy you might really be able to do business with. In all events, had a very interesting group of people, included uh, 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 former national security advisor, 
uh, two generals, a chief negotiator. And the key thing uh, about this process uh, was I really spent literally two years planning the process before the initial meetings. The second thing I did in terms of uh, facilitating dialogue, that's a neutral, involved Americans, Israelis, and Palestinians, many of whom had been involved in negotiations along the way. And this was with the support of uh, the Norwegian government. And it involved uh, the Crown Center at Brandeis as well as the program on negotiation. And uh, an Israeli and a Palestinian associated with the Brandeis program. And my colleague Jim Sabini is here. And our objectives were the following. We were going to get Israelis, Americans, and Palestinians together to talk about their internal domestic problems if, in fact, there were a deal that you wanted to implement. In other words, we invited people to come not to talk about the substance of what the deal would be. Indeed, one thing we did that was kind of unusual is we simply, as part of the process, sent them the deal. And we said, you may assume, and we're not going to discuss this at all, this, in fact, at the highest level, the political leaders have decided to buy on to these, this agreement in principle. And, but what we're going to talk about is what your problems would be in implementing this deal. And of course, the Israelis and Palestinian leaders would have plenty of problems. The Americans were there, too, because they figured they'd have plenty of problems, too, because it's not as if all American domestic constituents would necessarily be supportive of the deal we described. And what we wanted them to do is, rather than for each of them spending two days telling the others what they must do to help them, we flipped it. And we asked them, we want you to brainstorm after you hear what stakeholder problems the other parties have, what could you do to help them better manage their internal conflicts? A question that they were not used to asking themselves. Uh, well, uh, what lessons did I learn from this? Uh, I learned a lot of lessons, I think. A lot of them is a key role that we lawyers play all the time is what I'd call process architecture. That's certainly true when we're mediators. We're designing a process to help people resolve conflicts. It's what you were doing uh, in terms of your negotiations. You were trying to figure out what process to involve the implementation. Ombudspersons all the times are dealing with small issues, but they're thinking about how do I manage this issue that's both helpful to the person in the room, where I'm also alive to what the broader implications for the institution uh, might be. Uh, what Sheila is figuring out how to do, although it's a very successful marriage, is how can she more effectively communicate with her husband, uh, whose political views might be uh, uh, somewhat different. But I think that helping lawyers develop the skills to think about how you can divide, design such processes can be helpful. A last point I just want to mention that's obvious, and that is so often, in terms of dispute resolution, transparency is the enemy. I've been talking about behind the table conflicts within a domestic constituency. Often, many of us have been involved in conflicts where within a company there are huge conflicts internally. It's very hard for people publicly to talk about those things if you don't create an environment where they feel safe because there are real political costs. And I think that, in fact, uh, that's certainly true uh, uh, in these intractable ethnic conflicts. Uh, where being able to have a degree of confidentiality where there aren't leaks to the press is essentially important. The tension and paradox, of course, is that you also, at the same time, have to be thinking about, in terms of implementation, how do you build political support later for implementation? 
and there often is a tension. Uh, does dialogue make a difference? This conflict persists. Uh, I think that in a small way, we might have made a difference. Indeed, uh, although I can't go into it in any detail now, 8,000 Jewish settlers were successfully evacuated from Gaza with no loss of life, notwithstanding what people feared were threats of an internal civil war. There was civil disobedience, and indeed, the, the, in one article, uh, the author claimed that the leaders of the settlement movement, they're rarely given credit for this, claimed that what they learned through the dialogue process in terms of the value commitments of people they had viewed as the other side and the enemy led them to, in fact, work to ensure there wasn't violence. It also led some of those liberals in Israel to realize that if they were ever going to successfully implement a resolution of this dispute, these settlers shouldn't be demonized, but they had to be embraced. And when they returned to Israel, they had to be treated with dignity. You had to worry about compensation. You had to worry about getting them jobs, something they didn't do with complete uh, success. Our time is up, uh, but uh, what do you think? A couple questions? Not about this, but more general. Well, I, I, I was struck by the similarity when you talk about the internal negotiation, where you have these different parts, so to speak, and trying to identify a core uh, mediative capacity within each group, uh, the personal and the political uh, coincide. They do indeed. Anyway, let me simply close by saying thank you for coming. And, and most of all, <clears throat> what I wish for all of you, building on what I hope you saw today, is I think as professionals, we lawyers can contribute so much to the fair and efficient resolution of conflict. I think it can be done. You don't have to be a mediator. You can do it when you're representing clients to make them feel heard, to help them understand what their underlying interests are, to do what's extremely hard, and that is to help them understand the perspective of their adversaries on the other side. Those are things I think we can do all the time uh, and uh, contribute to help healing the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.